reports from various groups working with annotating biodiversity data. Then we'll work on chartering a task group for a much needed applicability statement. Then we'll look at some example annotations for discussion. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time by entering a question in the chat and or raising your hand in the participant list. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. There. Please use this judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in your being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document, which has a link up on the slide for more information. Please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. Please bear with any technical difficulties we may have. Be sure to, and thank, I wanna thank all of the um, volunteers and session organizers. Um, things have been going really, really well this week and uh, hopefully we'll continue the rest of the day. Um, if there's a total failure of Zoom, uh, if everything freezes or video and audio are compromised, don't panic. The uh, Zoom administrator will be around to restart the session and get things back up and running. We'll be taking collaborative notes on um, the MediaWiki Etherpad instance, which is publicly available at um, the uh, etherpad wikimedia.org slash p slash TDWG 2020 AIG notes um, document, which is linked off of the, uh, the current slide and um, link uh, is in the chat. At the end of the session, we'll copy these notes into the um, Tadwig GitHub repository for uh, the annotations interest group. So, uh, somewhat ambitious agenda for today. Um, we'd like to hear from uh, various folks in the uh, community about what they're doing or thinking about with annotations. Um, spent a little time working on a, a charter for a task group to create um, an applicability statement for the uh, World Wide Web Consortium's um, web annotation vocabulary and web annotation data model. Um, we'll take a, a quick look at those um, and work on revising the initial draft charter, identifying core participants, um, see if we can get uh, this thing which has been languishing too long moving. And then we'll spend a little time um, discussing some uh, example annotations. Um, so let me start to, do we have uh, Lutz here from uh, Anasys? Yes, hello Paul, I'm here. Very good. Um, can you uh, give us an update on uh, what uh, Anasys has been uh, up to with annotations? Um, yes, so there's not much to say because I am working since for, for, for two years for the GGBN project. So Anasus has, has currently no funding, but uh, since uh, so the last meeting I attended in, 20, in Ottawa, 2017, um, we achieved to bring up the, the new uh, release version of, of the whole system. Um, this is functional and working, and uh, I observed that uh, the, the MISA um, herbarium has connected itself to the Another system and this frequent or more or less frequently using it, so they are not too much annotations, but they uh, have around 90 annotations done within the last year, one and a half year. And so that's yeah, that's other news from Anasus. Okay,
uh, Paul mute. Very good. Do you have a, uh, a sense of uh, how heavily the, uh, the system's been used for annotating biodiversity data? Okay, do we have um, Arthur on? Before you move on, Paul, we have a question to Lutz from Matthias in the chat. Um, he asks, is there a way to mass export the annotations made for a single institution from Anasys? Question to you, Lutz. Uh, mass uh, uh, you can, it is possible to, to request annotations via web service or via uh, yeah, we have a web service where you can request annotations and you can also get a list of all identifiers from, from any annotations we have in the system and from all records we have in the system. So, but there is no hard export of, of anything. So, I don't know if that's, if that's what you expected or if I can uh, answer your question with that, then or if there are more to ask. Very good. We have uh, Arthur on. I'm here, Paul, but I don't know anything about the ALA. Okay. I don't work with the ALA. Lee does that. But I know just that Peggy Newman is here. She may be able to say something about the ALA. I'm not sure. Very good. Was, uh, my question here was, yeah, who, who we had from uh, ALA to talk about where things were. So, uh, uh, yeah, Peggy or Lee, do we have any uh, current information on annotations in the ALA? Uh, Peggy here. You've put me on the spot. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't really, I'm not really overly familiar um, with with the topic. Anasys, um, we don't use. We have the annotations. Um, we have the annotation system. We haven't done any work on it um, in the past year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And it, but it's it's been uh, work, working well for you, uh, integrated in the ALA system. Yes, that's right. Yeah, been good. Um, I think we have uh, Nicholas from IDIC Bio. Sure, so <clears throat> on the topic of annotations, um, we have some historical work at IDIC Bio that was done prior to, in fact, all of the current members of the uh, IDIC Bio IT team arriving. That work was the ePanda project. Mm -hmm. So we retain about two and a half million annotations that are inside the database, but uh, we, would, we would have to find a way to associate those with the existing records outside of the system. So they're not invisible to the public right now. So I don't think there's, there's a strong effort at the moment to make that available, but that provides us with a model for how that might happen in the future for as far as the database structure and so forth. Paul, this is Gil. Let me say one more thing about that. What he said, what Nicholas said is absolutely 100% correct. The ePanda project was really designed to, uh, and Talia Kareem can talk about this too because she was a copy on the project, but um, it was designed to search for records in paleobiology database that might match collection records in the IDIC bio database at some level of certainty. So for example, if there was a reference, a literature reference in PBDB that indicated the author was some author X in site Y and, and all those matched up, then uh, ePanda would assume that that was a good reference and a good annotation and that that article probably related to the specimen collected at the same time, same place, by the same person. Um, then there was a range after that. So for example, if <clears throat> the time was right, the person was right, but the specimen wasn't mentioned in the article, the assumption was that it was more or less 
kind of the bycatch of that collecting event. Mm -hmm. So that, that collection was probably happened at the same time since it was same place, same person, same date, et cetera. Um, and, and our goal was to try to do these through an API that was not associated really with either one of the two databases. It was an independent API that was uh, exploring these databases, trying to find matches. And we were successful at about two and a half million at a level that would be um, worth annotating a record. And you know, our plan, of course, would be to try to match those records up and indicate a, a certainty level that we feel that it is you know, some level of certainty that that is actually uh, could be used as an annotation for that particular specimen record. Does that sound right, Talia? You may not, you may want to say something about this, but. Nope, that sounds, that's good. So that, uh, that sounds like a, a really interesting case. The, um, the primary kinds of annotations that Anasys and ALA have been accumulating, as, as I understand, are um, um, human generated comments on occurrence data that um, you know, the, the identification of this thing can't be right, or here's a new identification for this image, or um, here's a um, proposed correction to some textual data in the, the occurrence. Um, but in in ePanda, you're linking, you're, you're creating assertions that a link should exist between a essentially literature resource and occurrence resource with some metadata describing the basis and certainty of that assertion, um, which is a yeah, nice complicated case. Yes, a literature annotation is what we were going for. Yeah, yeah. Um, back to Arthur. Um, that ties nicely with uh, what's been going on in um, biodiversity data quality interest group. Um, do you and uh, Lee want to talk about the needs that have been expressed there for uh, annotations? Uh, unfortunately, Lee hasn't joined us tonight, which is a pity. He's a, an early bird. He likes to go to bed early, and it's about half past 10 at the moment here. Um, <clears throat> the data quality interest group, particularly the, um, the tests that we've developed, 99 data quality tests, um, they produce, um, we, we're hoping that they, they, one of the outputs is um, whether they're compliant or not compliant, how they're not compliant, etc. Uh, Paul probably knows more detail about this than I do on, on how the um, annotations out of that then are to arise. But we're hoping, and we've we've looked at, and we'll talk about this later when we're talking about the task group um, for those annotations to be through the W3C annotation. Uh, data model and such that you can have uh, annotations of annotations and our expectation is that if there's a, an annotation to the data, um, if there's a correction made, for example, that that annotation doesn't disappear, but it says that it, an annotation to the annotation has been made that says that this has been, you know, what has been done to it or, you know, um, this is correct for the following reasons or whatever. So um, having had a look at these, it, it looks like the W3C um, web annotation data model, uh, etc., and can handle this quite well. And that's what we're hoping to do. We've had to put that part of it off for uh, 12 months because the annotations interest group hasn't had a convener for that period and we've been pushing that to one side but if we get this task group off um, set up then it will be working very hard on that I'm sure. Thanks Paul. 
Yeah, very good. Let me put in um, some some things um, for uh, for Lee that um, within the biodiversity data quality interest group, um, there are now four four task groups. Two of them are directly pertinent to this. One is um, framework for data quality that's been phrasing a vocabulary for um, talking about data quality needs and data quality reports and mechanisms for making data quality assertions. Um, the other is a task group on defining standardized tests for data quality. Um, and the tests are defined in terms of the framework and in a way that is neutral about how they are used. Um, so you could use the tests in just spreadsheet reports that you hand out to people on their data, or you could take the test results and wrap them into um, annotations and associate them with um, um, particular occurrence records. So um, it's, it's a, I think, designed to be uh, a, able to fit well into annotations, but not require them for, uh, for purposes. Um, yeah, very good. Um, anything else on data quality interest group? Okay, do we have uh, Andy Bentley on? Hey, Paul, yeah, I'm here. Um, you had some uh, thoughts earlier in the week on uh, annotations and uh, f future models for handling biodiversity data. Do you want to? Uh, sure. To um, so a couple of days ago, we had a session looking at um, extended specimens and the DISCO OpenDS, um, Open Digital Specimen Concepts, um, looking at similarities and, and differences between the two and, and sort of working towards a global standard of how we can link all of this, all of this data together associate, associated with specimens. Um, you know, there's obviously an understanding that we need to be able to link specimens and, and, and all of the preparations associated with them to all of the digital products that are being created associated with these specimens and that there's a, there's a, <clears throat> a necessary sort of digital cyber infrastructure that's needed in order to be able to pull this all off. Um, in terms of having unique identifiers and being able to, you know, link all of this stuff through through cyberspace. Um, one of the interesting th um, things that came up um, concerning that is this this idea of uh, a sort of transactional publishing mechanism to be able to to link all this stuff together, very much like a sort of blockchain kind of uh, um, blockchain inspired network kind of kind of idea. Um, where you're actually publishing all of the transactions associated with specimens rather than a cache of data that you're publishing every so often. Um, obviously, this has implications not only for linking data together, but also um, for being able to showcase annotations to data um, in terms of, um, you know, everything that's associated with a specimen would simply be a transaction. So if you loan that specimen from one person to another, um, that would simply be a transaction on the specimen. If you um, create another preparation on that specimen, that would just be another transaction. If a gen bank sequence is published associated with a specimen, that would be another transaction. And similarly, if somebody goes in and annotates a particular record, um, that would also be a transaction associated with that with that um, with that particular record. So um, we are we are trying to work towards a global standard. We are we are having discussions at the moment and bringing in all of the necessary players. Obviously, there's a lot of this infrastructure that is already sort of being developed piecemeal um, in little pieces. And so we're trying to um, bring together all the interested parties and figure out where the holes are, where the gaps are in terms of trying to put this all together, um, working towards a bunch of workshops that would hopefully start discussing some of these ideas, um, not only, you know, associated with linking data, but also the, the entirety of the expended, extended specimen network concept, which is more than just um, linking data. It's a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, 
and then hopefully working towards an action plan or an implementation plan at some point that would um, be funded here in the, in the US by the NSF, hopefully, um, but also then looking at a global, a global infrastructure where um, various other initiatives would be, would be funded um, in other places, and then we would bring it all together uh, to form sort of some sort of um, global standard associated with that. Very good. Uh, hopefully there will be more coming in the future. Great, thank you Andy. That's a, a, a nice, let's think about the future view. Um, Tim, any uh, questions coming up in the chat? There's some discussion, but no questions. Very good. Um, okay, do we have uh, Steve Baskoff from uh, Audubon Core? Hi. Um, so Audubon Core, over the last uh, six months or so, has been focused a lot on dealing with sounds, and one of the issue that issues that came up was um, segmenting long sound recordings into um, segments and then figuring out how you link those segments to the main re recording. And so the term <clears throat> annotations has been uh, applied to this process. And uh, so one of the questions we had is like, how is that related to this sort of broader idea of annotations that the group is studying here? So, and it's also a broader issue <clears throat> that goes beyond just sound because most uh, multimedia types have the, the same sort of fundamental issue where you want to take some smaller portion of the media item, like a, a, a part of a still image or a, a time segment of a video and be able to refer to that. So we have sort of a segmentation problem and then the uh, issue of attributing that segmentation to somebody I think is where the W3C annotation model comes in. So we haven't gotten very far in terms of reaching any decisions on how to do this. I am going to paste in the chat and then we can see that it gets in the document. Uh, Dan Stoll, who's one of our point people on sound, wrote a nice kind of summary document about different, um, different methods that people have used to segment sound. And um, the one that he's pick, that they're currently favoring is the uh, using the music ontology because it's like fairly well uh, used. But we also have spent quite a bit of time looking at the triple IF, um, how they handle uh, segmentation, and the triple IF model is uh, directly linked to the web annotations model. So, so we've, we've done a lot of talking and thinking about this, but um, we are sort of lacking in direction. And so we are hoping that this group will help us to, uh, to have some direction, um, if not on the actual segmentation process itself, at least on how those segmenting actions could then be uh, connected to a more standardized uh, way of describing the annotation process itself. Very good. Um, actually, two of the um, annotation documents I threw up for uh, discussion today are uh, relate to uh, that issue of segmenting media, identifying um, regions of interest in, in media. Um, from uh, so, the, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, Rich, uh, just, Rich Pyle just pasted something in the chat, which is essentially the same question I was asking you in email last night, which is, uh, are, are annotations in the sense of like, assertion, making assertions about data and relationships, the same thing as uh, capturing pieces of the act of, of creating chunks of structured chunks of multimedia. I don't know if I butchered Richard's question, but um, I can, I can 
qualify that. So basically I'm asking is annotations a system to replace all of our remarks fields, you know, that we have various Darwin core terms for, you know, just chunks of blob human readable text that we want to attach to records that have various contexts, or is there a functional difference between what we're calling an annotation and what we might think of as a remarks field or a remarks term. And, and if there is a distinction, how do we find the boundary between them? Yeah. My, my reading of the work that's come out of the um, World Wide Web Consortium, which, which goes back uh, quite a ways. And, and when, when Tandwig were involved in some of the predecessors of, of that work is, um, is very rich um, that um, it, it readily accommodates annotations as simple text assertions by humans being linked to web resources at fairly arbitrary levels of, of granularity. So we can talk about an, an, an annotation as an assertion tied to an entire resource or to some identified in, in various different specified ways, re regions of interest within that, um, that, um, that resource. Um, and that, that could be also an annotation simply asserting that there is a region of interest that I want to bookmark within this larger resource. Um, or much more complicated scenarios of, of we have a, um, a piece of software that wants to make um, automated assertions about um, portions of a data set or portions of a media object. Um, the, there's many, many possible things that can be done um, within that, that um, annotation framework. Well, let me ask this then based on that. Would it be fair to say that annotations are assertions that apply to digital objects or digital sources, whereas remarks are <laughs> annotation like things that are applied to non digital objects like physical specimens and events and and whatnot. Is that a distinction. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. That so I might want to make a comment on a record saying this record is incorrect. It needs to be corrected or this record relates to this other record. That would sound like an annotation to me. But as like, uh, you know, as mm -hmm. Ian said, if, if, if it was found dead on the road, that's, that's, that's a comment that applies to a physical thing rather than a digital object. I, I, maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds here, but I'm just trying to, in, in designing data models, I wanna make sure that you know, I'm not overloading an annotations thing with things that ought to be really more, as Tom says, data rather than metadata. Yeah, the, um, well, we, if we go, go back to annotations as we've been using it for decades in our community. Um, that's what the botanists have been terming the little labels that they stick on herbarium sheets that are subsequent pieces of information, which may be remarks on the order of you're found, found dead on the road, or um, maybe new determinations. Um, so we've, we've got a a, a long history of human assertions being written on pieces of paper being associated with the uh, the specimens um, that that we've thought of as annotations, um, and so some some of those fit in the category of it. It's a remark about the occurrence, um, and I think in any any kind of assertion we want to make about the occurrence record is a uh, is fair game for uh, for the WC3 annotations. We'll get really quickly into the you know, met metaphysics of uh, uh, 
the identifier is pointing at the physical object or the identifier is pointing at the uh, um, the digital metadata object of the physical object. Um, but uh, the, the annotation in the WC3 sims points at a identifier for some web resource. Um, so the, the annotations are living in the, um, in the digital domain. But that web resource could be, you know, a digital representation of um, all the metadata about some, uh, some specimen, some, uh, some occurrence. Paul, if I may, um, I can't raise my hand as the host. Um, a couple of things. One is that uh, I think this conversation is incredibly important to the digital specimen, extended specimen discussion because we still, at least I, still struggle with the separation of the physical and things done to the physical and the digital and things done to the digital and, you know, these kinds of remarks and things uh, have implications and I would like to see that much more clearly uh, as Rich said, you know, is there a line to be drawn? I'm not sure there is. I think it's going to stay gray. Uh, but we should at least be as clear as we can. And I also want to say that as part of Filtered Push and, and oh. the work that Paul and I and others did, one of the things that we saw happening was what we called annotation conversations. So because you can make remarks within the annotation framework, right. you know, what was my motivation? What's my evidence? Those types of things. People were having you know, discuss, annotation discussion saying, well, I feel that this evidence says that this state should be this. And then someone else comes in and says, yes, but I have evidence and a motivation to have my state be that. Uh, and then whoever the curator is has to take that conversation, digest it and make the best decision they can for what they actually put in their database. So these conversations were an interesting sort of middle ground of, uh, and it also can involve machines, by the way, uh, <laughs> Uh, an interesting middle ground that, that came about because our data is so dynamic and constantly being having its quality assessed. Just a comment. Thanks, so, Jim. Um, Paul, Paul, we've got some people with their hands up. We've got Thomas and then Deb who would like to comment. I, I don't think you can see the, the hands while you're presenting. Yeah. Uh, well, James and uh, Paul, I was actually just going to bring up filter push. Uh, Thanks, James, for actually kind of answering my question right then, because uh, really the, the whole idea of, of some of the, the, the things you guys did in that, that process was to think about this. Uh, and I think there could be lessons learned and use cases within that project that could help, I know, with, with what Andy's talking about. Because I, I, I don't, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here, but I think there's there's implications of getting this wrong, which really could uh, confuse or conflate some of the things that we really need to do to move forward with the true annotation process. So uh, I would just say, uh, go back and look at, at some of the things you guys did in Filtered Push because they're extremely relevant to this conversation right now. Uh, thanks, Tom. And, and I think I would say, you know, I agree, um, our documentation is still available. We have piles of use cases and all our trials and tribulations. And I think as Tim might agree with me, you know, I think we had a good framework, the W3C uh, annotation, um, as we work through that and annotating data, that really, we made that make sense. The standard is great. It's the implementation of it, the technology, the ability to use it, that's our real struggle now, uh, and continues to be a struggle, unfortunately. Um, so I think we have, I think we know, understand a lot of what we want to do. It's simply the technology behind implementing it in the various systems that we have. Maybe Tim wants to say something about that. Uh, I've been probably too disconnected to comment accurately. I, I think at the time I had the impression that no one was funded or given the mandate to actually operate the infrastructure. So there was a good design but not a, you know, at Jiva, for example, we run uh, indexing of occurrence data. We need an equivalent for managing the, uh, the annotations. That, that was my impression at the time. And the, uh, the discussions that Tim and I had about um, filtered push were, were really pointing at the, uh, the set of requirements we had 
particularly for information security, were mandating that we build a system that was too complicated. There were too many pieces in it. Um, and, and um, well, uh, we, we, need to, we need to move on. Was, was there a, um, another a question, as well. question in the chat that was, uh, uh, um, that we can't I, put off to later? Go ahead. Oh, uh, I just wanna echo what they just said. It was a nice lead in that we need to look at those past use cases and the current ones to see where can we make the difference in getting to implementation, Paul? Because the problem I see and still in the community is where it's been turned on. So for example, the annotation system in Symbiota, it does sometimes result in, again, so many annotations that require actions that the local collection managers are overwhelmed by the massive task, which is why I asked in the chat. So this notion of including humans more in the process of annotating the records publicly as well is another step in which we need to think hard about the round tripping process because if we build it right, people are going to come. They're already doing it. And how are we going to make that manageable so that, sure, annotations are possible, but now all of a sudden we have so many and we haven't addressed the bottleneck at the application end uh, back at the source. Yeah, di digressing real briefly in uh, filtered part, we had integration with um, Symbiota and with a data quality analysis tool. Um, that we didn't turn on the annotation piece because we could see that was going to point a great huge pipeline of um, data quality assertions at the, the data in Symbiota that was just going to overwhelm the, uh, the curators. Um, anyway, um, uh, attributions. Um, do we have um, David Shorthouse? Um, you do, but you put me on the spot like you huh. have others. Um, um, well, I, I just wanted to, to check with you whether you had any uh, thoughts you wanted to express um, in the meeting today, following up on uh, what you were talking about in, in the people session uh, yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we have, uh, examine the annotations, so the W3C model, um, kind of in parallel to the work we were doing um, with um, um, our attributions work. Um, but I, I think there's a very strong possibility of alignment there with both of, the, both of those kinds of approaches, um, where, um, as was mentioned earlier, things are quite tricky to manage is um, when that pipeline is opened. Um, and in the case of uh, the work that I've been doing on a pet project, I would dearly love to have that loop closed back to the source such that the annotations and the attributions that might be made um, have a home and they don't just continually reside in the ether and, and not affect change um, back at the source. So that's my, my small message. Um, but I'm game to try pushing out um, how to represent annotations from the project that I've been working on. I can do that very quickly and would love to do so as a test case. So that's it for me. Excellent. James, do you have any quick thoughts on Dina? Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say very quickly that in the sense of collection management systems, some of you know that uh, I'm involved, I don't know if Falco's on the call here, um, and David Shorthouse and Christian Jandro, so a bunch of us in the Tadwick community, uh, developing a new sort of flexible web service-based uh, collection management system. And we, um, we haven't come to like hard decisions about annotation services within our system, but we know they are going to be central uh, and so I think it's just, all, all this is is a call out to say that as part of, you know, annotations, both integrated and then being able to be shared with the broader community like a GBIF uh, aggregator, um, we, we are definitely going to have to address this and we'll be thinking hard about this in the next year. So it's just a, just a comment really. Great. Thank you, James. Um, so, um, yeah, let me give 
A little more background. Um, several years ago, um, in the annotations interest group, we um, uh, came to a consensus that we needed to draft a charter for a task group um, to draft an applicability statement for the World Wide Web Consortium's products on, on annotations um, to say how, how could we effectively use these in uh, the Tadwig community. Um, and um, we uh, um, put in place a, uh, a co-convener for the annotations interest group um, just before I got elected to be chair of the TAG and couldn't keep pushing annotations forward. Um, but then uh, that person got hired out of our community elsewhere. Um, and we've been sitting for, um, yeah, be better than two years now without uh, any movement in the, uh, the annotations interest group. Um, so now, now that I'm back, I'd, I'd really like to see us move forward on uh, some, something that what we've heard in this set of reports, there, there really is a, a real need for in the, uh, the community. Um, let me give a little context of um, the nature of Tandwig standards. Um, so Tandwig standards are documents which come out of task groups which are chartered under the care of some interest group. Um, are presented to the executive, go through a review process, and um, if ratified, once ratified, go on to um, the care of a, a maintenance group. There are four different categories of Tadwig standards. Um, the first are technical specifications, um, like Darwin Core. Um, the next are applicability statements that say, how do you use a technical specification from Tadwig or another domain within our domain? Um, and this is the, the really natural fit for, we've got some WC3 recommendations that are pertinent to annotating biodiversity data rather than reinventing the wheel. Let's just write a document that says, use these. Here's how we provide some guidance on use of those in, in the community. Um, an alternative would be um, a best current practice document that really those meant for cases where there isn't a, another standard to point at and say, just use this. So it feels like an, an applicability statement is the, the good target. And the, um, the fourth category is um, data standards. So lists of valid values and controlled vocabularies. Um, in the um, World Wide Web Consortium, there's a number of recommendations that are pertinent to this effort. Um, one is, well, set of three linked ones. It's web annotation data model, web annotation vocabulary that supports that model, and a web annotation protocol that can be used to, to transport those documents. Um, the web annotation protocol is m more independent of the, the, the structures of the data. Um, and so we, we might or might not want to say, you should do things this way in a, in a protocol sense, but I think it, it's very clear that the, um, how, however we want to store, transport, reference the annotation, documents, the um, structuring them with the, the data model and the using the, um, the annotation vocabulary are, uh, are very, very relevant. Um, there are also some uh, other, other relevant um, WC3 um, documents. Steve alluded to, to one earlier. There's also a, um, a media fragments um, URI 
specification that, that may be relevant. Um, let me say in in the etherpad uh, a um, a link in the agenda under item two to a very draft document for um, the um, a charter for a, a task group. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty rough. Um, the really big needs are for someone or somebody's to be willing to step forward as convener or co-conveners of the group and for us to identify a, a list of uh, core members. Um, I'm really happy to to serve as a, a core member. I'd really rather not serve as, uh, as conveners. I'm being tapped by Arthur to convene a, another task group in, uh, in data quality. And I'd, I'd be able to spread a little bit thin. Um, but uh, very, very much looking for, uh, for help in this and um, people who are uh, willing to, to step forward. Um, Tamara James, could you drop the uh, the link to that uh, into the chat as well. And uh, James, do you have any uh, thoughts from the uh, side of the executive on, uh, is that Tim, Tim or, uh, sorry, James or Deb, is, you're on the call as well. Do you have any thoughts from the uh, perspective of the executive on uh, moving uh, this process forward? No, only just, uh, I think it's a great idea and a long time coming. We, we've been talking about this for too long. Um, so uh, <laughs> very happy to see this move forward and I, I hope we can find some champions. I'm certainly willing to help. Um, but I don't think I can champion. Yeah, so I'll take that as we can put you in the list of uh... Paul, are you still there? Your sound dropped. Go ahead. Oh, okay, you are still there. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have uh, Deb Paul on? Oh, hi, Paul. Sorry, I was thinking James. What did <laughs> ditto what James said? Um, <laughs> as you can tell, what I what I'm super interested in is the part that we we've seen a lot of work done here, and I think I can. This will be very exciting, and I would like to continue the conversation about the, the realities of, of implementing this in a way that we really deal with the hurdle of that round tripping bottlenecks because we're going to make it possible for people to do and to do it really well. Um, we're really addressing the sort of source of the annotations they're going to be coming in and that's great. But uh, people implementing it, the actions required or needed on the, um, on the source side are going to be critical. Good. I dropped out there, sorry. Tim, James, are we back in order? We are, we can hear you. Very good. Um, so I think in, anybody on the call who is interested in participating as a, a core member in, in this task group, um, a uh, 
either uh, stick stick a um, note into the the chat that you'd be interested, or um, drop your name directly into the uh, the Etherpad under the uh, um, under that item. And let me put in. Paul, one thing that might be valuable is uh, for Robert Sanderson to give us uh, an impression of how annotation of data within the W3C annotation standard stands and, and what we might do to, uh, to motivate it or to, uh, if it has broader use, Robert, I'm not sure, are we the only ones who had this crazy idea or, or has, this, uh, has this lived on? No, no, not at all. Um... So the, um, the W3C spec, um, when we were working on, on, the, on the spec, we discussed how to annotate data um, and whether we needed specific um, format-based selectors to say, you know, select row 10 of this spreadsheet. Um, and we decided that that was one step too far um, that we should be um, focusing on very broad selection mechanisms. Um, so we were careful to um, allow for extensibility for annotating of different data formats. Um, the one thing that I would say is more, uh, not necessarily more complex, but less well defined uh, in the model is whether you are annotating the representation um, or the entity itself. So to the discussion in the chat about are we, are we annotating the real world specimen or are we annotating the, um, the description of the specimen? Uh, that has been a long standing argument. I use that word um, intentionally um, in the W3C for probably decades now. Um, and yes, no need to, to go into the details of it. But uh, we did not want to open the can of worms. So we're, uh, we're silent about, about that um, with the expected uh, resulting ambiguity of exactly what is happening. So uh, if the if the intent is to annotate, um, say, row five in a CSV file, that is very straightforward. If the intent is to annotate the specimen which is described in row five of a CSV file, that is very complicated. If it is to annotate the specimen identified by a particular URI, that's quite straightforward. So there's, there's sort of levels um, of of complexity there uh, and good ways to do it and possible but less good ways to do it. Um, so the, the flip side is uh, the annotation body, so the comment itself um, or the, the entity being that is doing the referring. Um, with different motivations that can be um, also a little bit unclear as to exactly the relationship. Um, so it's not a stand-in for linked data or RDF or a relationship model. Um, we wanted to not try to reinvent reconciliation uh, with all of the decades long arguments in the W3C about the best way to do that. Um, and instead stick as closely as we could to the sort of core annotation use cases. And um, so yep, comments, remarks, tags, classifying things, identifying things, describing things, and, and so on. And you can see the um, how that panned out in the list of motivations 
um, in the annotation model document. Um, that was sort of our core set of use cases that we felt was in scope for the work. Um, yes, but no, it's a, it's a very good question, one that we, we discussed but could not come to any, any reasonable consensus around um, during the work, um, just because there's, there's multiple ways to do it, none of which are obviously correct or obviously better than any of the others. So hence the, the silence. Thank you, Robert. That's uh, that's very valuable to know. We're not the only ones uh, lost in this fight. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, I know uh, one of the um, um, potential sorts of selectors that um, Bob Morris brought to you from uh, Filtered Push was uh, a a query selector that um, was was going into that area where you you really didn't want to go into those in in the form of um, um, any data which satisfies the criteria of this query. Um, the annotation applies to those data. Um, and we we were expressing that in in filtered push in terms of um, Darwin core terms. So a a Darwin core occurrence record which had a um, latitude value greater than 90 degrees had applicable to it an annotation that said your latitude is out of range. Um, we'd, we'd explored that in, in filtered push, but that was, uh, yeah, get, getting into the, those realms that you didn't, didn't want to explore. We've had uh, Dan with his hand up for quite some time. So Dan, could you unmute and Comment? Hi. Uh, yeah, it's not been too long. It's okay. Um, so uh, I just wanted to put a comment in here about audio because um, as Steve mentioned, I'm one of the people that's been trying to think this through. Um, so if I just, oh yeah, I'm not allowed to share my screen. I was going to, um, so the uh, W3 media fragments, um, uh, specification is kind of the basis of identifying subregions of media. And um, just just for a pause, I made yeah. you a co-host for a second if you want to share your screen. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go to just to get the exact bit of web page just to make it really easy to talk about. So in the W3 um, media frags, here we've got how they indicate time regions. So here's a, a time region beginning at 10, ending at 20 seconds. Um, also a time region that begins at 10 and ends whenever. Another one that begins whenever and ends at 20. So that's the basic way of, of representing time. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing that's a little bit limiting uh, for audio and presumably for other types of annotation is that it's quite common to have point-like annotations as opposed to segment-like annotations. And because the um, temporal format here is very simplified, I don't see a clear way of separating those things out. So if whatever's going forward could, could consider some issues around that, that would be really useful. Um, one other slightly related comment is in, in the Audubon core discussions, we've also been talking about frequency ranges. So this is time ranges, but if we also think about frequency ranges, I think from what Robert said just before, that could come in as a kind of extension on top of what's in the basic media fragments model. Uh, but just to put, a, put that out there, so in audio in particular, we're interested in annotating often time frequency regions. Thanks, Dan. So it may be worth jumping forward to the um, example annotations. I have one that I, I put in, um, in um, it's actually number example three for audio region um, that um, um, is in the um, the Etherpad document. Um, Tim, Tim, could you 
drop that link into the chat. Sorry, which chat? Um, the Sorry, aud audio region of interest in time domain link. It's um, the on the annotations GitHub um, documents example three audio Jason. Um, So that's in the form of a WC3 annotation. Um, in the chat. Which are. Paul, did we lose you again? He's clearly having sound issues. Yeah, Paul said he has uh, he had some bandwidth issues. Um, hopefully, he will return. Mm. So, I don't know. Oh, did you make it back, Paul? Sorry, this is Dan talking. Hi, Dan. Um, I'm just checking to see if Paul Paul reappeared. Paul, can you hear us? You're on mute, if you can. Paul is muted. I don't know if he knows that. Yes. He is. I think he's left and coming back, hopefully. Unfortunately, I don't think either uh, Tim or I have the ability to drive these cases. <laughs> Just while we're, we're waiting there, James, a reminder for those that uh, are willing to be part of that um, task group to add their names into the notes document. We've only got three people there at the moment. Yes, we'll definitely need all the help we can get on this one. And I know there's lots of people out there who have uh, experience. It's, it's not a daunting, for those who, of you who are new to this, it's, it's not a daunting process. It's just a process. Uh, and, and it takes some due diligence. But, uh, you know, I think the key point, as you see from standards development, those of you who are familiar with it, is that it takes use cases from broad audiences. We have to make sure that we cover all the bases. So it, it takes a while to get that organized. The actual spec and the standard, developing the standard isn't so bad, especially when we have good technical people, like I see Steve adding his name to the list, um, that, that helps. Um, and so it really is just the motivation, uh, keep, keeping the ball rolling. Um, it's not, uh, don't be afraid if you've never been involved before. It's, it, it really just, it's just a process. And I should say that in the Tadward perspective, it's a process that's much better defined than it used to be, uh, thanks to the diligent efforts of Steve and others. James, how do I know if I'm afraid or not? <laughs> Tom. 
<laughs> you have years of experience. I'm still afraid of this, but but actually, I, I, I mean, I keep going back to this in my head. I mean, this is something for years we 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 been batting around and it always comes back to the same thing. It's the quality and the social side of it. I think technically we can jump. I mean, there's, there's a lot of technical things that we can work out. How do we deal with the other side of it? And that's kind of the, the stop to the, the, you know, that kind of crass thing I put in there about the, you know, annotations happen is, is really more of a social issue. People are afraid of it. And I think, you, you know, the annotations themselves and the metadata and the meta metadata and all of that uh, become a hindrance to many. But actually, if you, you know, if you think about it as value added to what you're doing, it becomes, becomes really useful. Uh, but nobody can deal with the, the current system, which is, you know, for GBIF, if I get emails or for a uh, catalog of life, I might get 10,000 changes, which none of which I understand. So how do we get to a point where socially we're we're comfortable with this, and I think that's that's not something we can add. You know, this is a this is a technical group, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges. So yes, I am scared, but I'm well, I'm willing I'm willing to get over my phobias. I mean, you're talking about the the implementation side. I I'm talking about people being scared about helping uh, develop a standard, <laughs> but uh, I completely agree that on the implementation side, the social component, which Filter Push dealt a lot with, we we talked to a lot of people. We you know tried to explain the value, et cetera. But knowing that daunting piece of what happens when a machine hits me with a thousand different geo references, you know uh, which one do I choose? Those kinds of problems. Yeah. Um, well. It is, it is a social problem. There is no good answer to it right now. Um, you know, I think the data mining, AI sides of things will help us. There are good tools that are helping us sort of just cut the chase and get to what we need and help us make good decisions as humans. Um, but that's a place that I need, we need a bunch of people working in. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, it's the, the idea that I feel like everybody else knows more than me, so I'm willing to accept the annotations and changes they make. Good luck that, that, that trust piece is something, Tom, that we ignore all the time because it's so yeah, dangerous. Absolutely. It's so dangerous to trust. And one of the things that's interesting, Tom, is uh, in the filtered push context, we, uh, when, we, when we did this and when we, when we uh, put it together, we promised not to let just anybody into the house. In other words, the data store that we had, the triple store, we, we did not let people come in and have the ability to mine it because, of course, there was a fear of the curators, the producers, that if people were able to mine the annotations and see that, well, James really isn't that good at identifying stuff, is he? Uh, you know, or James seems to change his mind every other day on what this thing is. Uh, it doesn't build good trust in me, right? It says, that, well, James isn't so trustworthy. Um, and we don't really deal with, you know, our history is not about trust. It is about trust. It's trusting experts, right? We publish papers, we publish taxonomic uh, papers, et cetera. And people say, well, James is an expert in this, so I trust his latest thing. And if somebody doesn't trust me, they do their research and they publish another paper that says, hey, this is what I think. Uh, yeah. You well, know, so I trust just... is a big thing. Yeah, we, I can't remember if it was filter push that had the universal bus in it, but I, I, you know, to me, the, the the technical side of this is is doable. Even at the machine trust level, it's doable. It's it's opening up the the valve to allow it to happen, and and just accepting the the changes. And I, and I mean, I, I I was part serious and part joking when I said you know centralization would help with this because then it just becomes an audit issue within a single system and, and there's ways to deal with good and bad on the audit change uh, but I guess you know when I think about it from a technical point of view it isn't hard when it when it gets to a for you know the trust issue I, I, I have no solution for that maybe you guys do I know Deb does Deb okay, work on the trust issue Thank oh you. yes I have many I have many ideas for that and yeah we, we have people raising their hands yes. and I'm getting the chance to speak here. Uh, could we hear from Arthur and then we have a question from Joe in the chat. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, the, one, one of the issues that we've had with annotations is not just the annotation back to the source, 
Uh, for example, and we, uh, Neil's mentioned earlier there, the usefulness of the ALA annotations going back to the source and people working on them, et cetera. But one of the problems we have is that the ALA might do a lot of data quality tests, for example, and then the data is exported to GBIF, but those annotations don't go with it. And so the annotations of the problems that have been found by ALA, the data goes into GBIF and those annotations aren't there. So we need a way to, to, to push the data, the, the annotations around with the data when that moves. Uh, and, and how you do that and how you store it is a more difficult issue and we've had discussions with Donald Hoburn before where he saw a big central annotation store. Um, others like to see, uh, would prefer to see it distrib distributed in some way. But uh, anyway, that's my point. The social issue is still a, a big one, of course, going back and, and getting people to do it. But if the annotations are well structured, and for example, the data quality um, annotations are well structured and people know it and there's just not a whole lot of free text for that part of it, then people are more likely to um, respond and work with it. Thanks, Arthur. Um, so the question from Joe on the chat, he asks, um, is there a well-defined test case with curators that have the time and capacity to handle it? Which is a, it's an interesting point. Does anyone know of a, a good example where, Joe, you just jumped on video, do you want to speak? Uh, I just, I have one, I'll, I'll pull out of my hat. So David Charthouse has these, within Bionomia, aggregating all these ORCID IDs and Wiki IDs and those probably could be sent back to collect a, a few select collections to see if they can integrate those back into their collections. Is that something that we could come up with a protocol to do to see if um, it can be incorporated and, and get a win? We uh, had a, uh, a case in um, we explored in uh, the curator project <coughs> of um, uh, actually working with the um, some of the curatorial staff at the um, Museum of Comparative Zoology, um, and and here I here I tend to use the word curator, <coughs> excuse me, not not to mean the position within the museum, but the person responsible for handling the data, which may be any kind of number of different positions of collection managers or curators or um, data folks. Anyway, anyway we um, um, ran data quality tools on um, scientific names data, um, among other places, the um, Museum of Comparative Zoology, and um, sent data quality reports back to some of the, um, the um, the data curators, largely in the form of um, this scientific name um, where you've got an authorship on the end of the scientific name. Um, we don't see parentheses and we think there should be parentheses there. Um, so find, finding matches to the, the name strings and making assertions about um, um, we think there's an issue with the, the name string that you have. Um, and sending those back as essentially spreadsheets of here are data records you need to, to look at. Um, found it to be an extremely difficult, slow, time-consuming process to get the curatorial staff engaged in working on, on those data quality issues. Um, you know, even though it's directly, directly pertinent to, to what they're doing all the time. So it's very much, that's an extremely pertinent question of um, the 
the presentation and the pipelines and the handling of the uh, data quality assertions and generally assertions about people's occurrence data. Oh, we have I, don't a, think, um, I don't think we got an answer or a, a, a strong call from uh, Joe's question, which was really, uh, we've got the, the annotations coming out of Bloodhound, which, uh, you know, the, the people working to uh, Bionoma, my apologies, uh, Bionoma tracker, um, has, they've got ORCID IDs on two and a half percent of the specimens in GBIF. And the, the question was how, how and is it wanted that these are brokered back to the, the people's original databases? So David wrote in the chat that the information is all available. He's published that as frictionless data packages in an open repository. And he, he's expressed yesterday he's keen to help, but we haven't managed to, to find a way um, or an appetite for people to bring that in um, on scale, I think, at this point. Tim, what, one thing I can add there um, is there one of the, the thing that we really learned in filtered push is that the bottleneck is the collection managers and curators. And the reality for them is what tools do they use? Well, they have all of these various collection management systems, spreadsheets, et cetera, and uh, the mappings backwards to them. We use one example and one example only because it was so hard to map back. And so I think the reality, some of the reality of this and the, these annotations has to be pushed back to all the collection management systems and say, hey, you know, you have to make it easier. Your data models or your uh, APIs have to allow communication and some kinds of tools that allow these curators to look at this data and to put it into their, you know, their databases so that when it's syndicated back out, it's syndicated back out correctly and doesn't exist in various weird versions you know, in space. And as a little piece of that, there will be a, a symposium and a discussion based around that kind of thinking at the upcoming uh, Tadwick conference uh, piece in October. Thanks. Uh, we, we had an Andrew Bentley with his hand up and it came down. Are you I was just going to mention exactly the same thing that James said, um, that it's vitally important that the collection management systems integrate with this, with this system. You know, we've been, we've been having talks with GBIF and various other people about integrating the data cleanup mechanisms into specify um, to be able to short circuit that process and make it, make it much easier for collection managers to be able to, um, you know, augment their data with all of these, with all of these changes that are coming in, not only from, the, the data cleanup system, but also from annotations. So I think, you know, that would, that would make it that much easier for collection managers and, and folks working with data to be able to incorporate those back into their databases. Thanks, Andrew. And we've got Deb as well with a hand up. Uh, so I wanted to add briefly that on a grant we have right now where we are enhancing data of published bat records and the major reason for doing that is to find the ones with locality strings that don't have coordinates and see if we can georeference them. But I um, specifically wanted to put in the grant an opportunity to add identifiers for people because finding where that somebody was on the planet in 1872 can help you georeference a specimen from 1872, right? So we have a plan where we met with the collections whom those published records come from to let them know we were doing this work um, and that we would then be publishing all the ORCID IDs and uh, QIDs that we come up with for the collectors who are no longer on the planet and give that data back to them. So they were very excited to know we're doing this work and several, you know, saying how, because we were trying to ask them, how do you need this data? How does it need to look so you can take it back? So we were trying to do that sort of reintegration discussion at the beginning of the grant not at the end of, oh, we did this thing. And by the way, here's this big pile. Uh, and so that's been, they've been very excited to be involved from the beginning, but we haven't, and of course, been talking and, and working Dave, David with David Shorthouse on this. Um, and that might be an interesting case to wonder how when, when we put the data, when we're done, how they could get it back. Because at the moment, it's more of a, we've done it and they know we're gonna give it to them and we would publish it 
but we hadn't talked about doing it in an automated way. Uh, thanks, Deb. And, and uh, Tim, I think we should return to Paul. You have five minutes. Do you want to, uh, to summarize uh, next steps? Sure, if my uh, connection stays stable enough. <laughs> Ap apologies to that for everyone, uh, uh, which is why I haven't been running videos. Uh, bandwidth is not necessarily that good that, that today. Um, I see we've uh, got some uh, some folks interested in uh, participating as as core members and task group that's uh that's a really great thing um we'll uh see if we can uh, solicit some more and work on uh, cleaning up this this draft charter and uh, and moving forward um the uh i don't think we've uh had had a chance to quite get through looking hard at all of the uh the examples that we had uh, on the agenda, but uh, it felt like a, a really good productive discussion. And um, we, we, we still really, really clearly have interest and need in um, um, for, for annotations within the, the biodiversity domain and clear, clear need for, uh, for guidance and uh, how how to um, how to do that, and uh, so a uh, getting a uh, an applicability statement uh, out the door would be a a, a really good uh, good move for for this community. Um, so let me ask uh, James, do you have any anything further uh, on this subject? I do not. Uh... The only thing I am supposed to do is to cheerlead for things coming up later today. Uh, Tim's taking the reins again in half an hour on uh, continuing part two of GBIF uh, um, data portal and, and biocase. And genomics is later on today. Uh, discussions if anybody are molecular people, I encourage you to attend that one. Uh, so that's what I had to say, Paul. Very good. Tim, do you have anything else? No, thank you. Thanks to you, Paul. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much to uh, to everyone for uh, participating. It was uh, def definitely a uh, a very great uh, great discussion. So, uh, um, and yeah, James James has said what I need to <laughs> had him on the script to say about yes, the next section. Uh, um, still, still more exciting stuff coming up. Um, today and um, um, today doesn't end the uh, the Tadwig meeting. Um, we'll be back for the um, uh, the regular sessions um, in October. So uh, anyway, thank you so much to everyone for uh, participating. Thank you for uh, um, James and, and Tim for, for helping out and um, for um, uh, my mind is blank. Um, William and um, Brenda. Brenda. Brenda, William and Brenda for uh, helping out on the technical side and for uh, everybody who's uh, been helping put together these Tadwig sessions has, uh, has really been a very good week. Thanks, Paul. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks and goodbye. Bye. Can we uh, stop the recording, please, Brenda?